Today we turn to uh, what is Stahl describes as the, the apex of, of private law as we, we move through institutions like property and, and tort and contract. Uh, these are institutions that you strongly associate with the, the basic system that the, the law, by, by which the law provides us with, with rights and adjudicates rights and, and disputes. Uh, today, you might not even think about family as part of, of uh, private law. You might not think of it as having a proper place between, uh, among property and contract and, and tort. In fact, uh, in our own curriculum, we, we separate it out following really just the, the practice of, of the world, perhaps wrongly in this, in this regard. Uh, it doesn't seem business related, uh, you know, property and, and contract, uh, tort, uh, these sorts of things seem very uh, business oriented as paradigms of, of private law. But, but family law today, even in the legal system, is often separated off into other courts and it's treated according to very different principles today. Uh, what, what passes for due process with respect to, to family issues is very different than the way we treat property. Uh, I, was, I was hearing some stories from uh, a gentleman I met at the, at the conference who works in the, the family court system in California uh, who takes people's children away from them uh, for a living. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, a demanding uh, profession for a Christian to be in because on, on the one hand, uh, the, the person sees abuses against, against children and, of course, his heart goes out to them. But on the other hand, uh, the standards of due process that are used for removing children from their parents are far lower than the standards that would be used for taking your car away uh, or taking your property away. Uh, among other things, if they took your car away, they'd have to provide you with some kind of, of compensation if the state takes away something for its own purposes because it, it wants to use it in a better way or they take your land, they have to provide you with compensation. And, and also the nature of, of the proof that they have to, to offer, uh, how it would have to be, to be done by, by legislative acts. Uh, but in the case of, of the removal of, of children, the standards are far more relaxed and, and very quick uh, and lots of people are, are very ill-equipped to protect their rights over their over their children. So uh, he was describing uh, some of the, the abuses that you can take a child away from their parents, not because they've done something wrong, not because they've, they have, have committed some offense, but because the, the state is, is determined that under certain conditions, children should simply be removed from their, their parents. Uh, of course, something that's very subject to potential uh, abuse. Um, but uh, this, is, this is going on. It's, it's not conceived of as a part of, of private law. The relations between parent and, and children aren't conceived of in the same terms that we would conceive of property rights and, and contract rights. These sort of sweeping administrative procedures would never be allowed where the state interjects itself between two members of a contract and says, well, we think you have managed this contractual relation wrong, so we're going to sweep in we're going to rearrange the, the institution. There's differences. Children are, are people. But the, my point to you is the jurisprudence has, has migrated away very much in the area of family law, much more so in the area of, of marriage law, where we, we treat the marriage between two people in the United States as something that anyone could dissolve without any reason, simply because they want to dissolve the relationship. We would never allow this in contractual relations, in a commercial contract. If one party said, I'd like out of the contract because I'm, I, I no longer like the person I made the contract with. I'm tired of them. Uh, you, of course, you couldn't do that. Or a business corporation. Imagine shareholders often are greatly divided in a business corporation. And if the, the group of shareholders, whenever it wanted to, could withdraw its share of capital, as we allow them to do in marriage, uh, this, of course, would, would be a disastrous way to run a business corporation, but we permit this with respect to, to marriage because we, we've removed it from the concept of, of private law. Stahl, and this is very important, thinks family is a, a part of private law. 
And uh, this is the hardest part of this book to understand because the, the law of marriage, family, children, parent-child relations, has changed more since Stahl's time than any other section that we've read. If, if Stahl were to read our contract law, our property law, our tort law, he would recognize it. But if he were to read our family law today, he would say, you have been the victim of a, a great and calamitous revolution. For, for 150 years, you have been living under a regime, this is what he'd say in the United States, maybe a little shorter in Korea, you've been living under a regime of marriage law that is so radical, you have been so indoctrinated into this system that you have forgotten what happened. You are living in a, in a nightmare and you can't wake up, you can't get a sense of the revolution that's happened. Just like people who grew up in communism, where they had, had never experienced freedom of contract, freedom of property, had no sense of what was missing. And when, when people come from communist systems into free systems, they have a very hard time adjusting because it's, it's like it's a limb that they've never used. It's like they have one arm that's been tied to their body all their lives. You untie it, it's weak, it doesn't work, it, it has no coordination. You say, you have, been, you have been so indoctrinated into a, a system of ideas that has nothing to do with the law as it's been known through most of human history, nothing to, know, uh, nothing to do with the, the law of God as the family is revealed in the, in the scriptures. Uh, the, the biggest way to understand this is uh, for Stahl, a family is a central element of private law. It belongs right with, with property. It belongs right with contract. It belongs right with torts. It is a, a way we express uh, our, our material necessity. We have to have certain material necessities, but private law binds us to do this, to satisfy our material necessities only with respect to the divine image in which we're made, right? Marriage is such a thing. And the essence of marriage is, and family is a corporate unity, a real union. Uh, our concept of, of marriage is individualistic. We deny union. We, we have no corporate identity for families today. Families have, have no independent corporate legal personality. There, there is no protection for the union. There is no, uh, no reflection in law that what is accomplished in marriage, that the, the relationship between parents and children is of a real thing, something that is real that has its own legal personality, that union between people, not just contracts between individuals, not just relations among individuals, but there is a dimension of human personality where we are actually united together. It's completely gone. And our, our law has, has, has decayed, and this is why we have the great oppressions of our day. Uh, we, we have no protection for marriage. We have weakening, ever weakening protections of the relationship between parents and, and children because we insist on viewing everybody as individuals. Uh, the, the human rights that we talk about, we talk about individual rights, the constitutional rights, individual rights, we, we have no understanding of the potential for corporate union of people in families. And, and that is in the scriptures, that was previously in the law, the, the essential function of family law was to recognize that, that people are not only living as individuals, that, that the human personality, what it means to be human is not just to live for myself and as myself, but also I can live as a member. Uh, I can be united to someone in love and I can, I can live as a member of a, a union which is greater than myself. Um, and that's lost today. We, we have no protection of that. So Stahl would, would be appalled at the revolutionary context in which we live. He would talk to you about family and he would say, no, you don't have a family law. You have a law uh, for connecting individuals more weakly in familial areas than you do in commercial areas. You, you have inverted the, the proper order of things. And if you, if you 
If you don't get this right, uh, you'll have a hard time understanding the scriptures. If you don't repair this problem in your mind, if you don't undo the indoctrination to which you have been uh, exposed, you'll have a hard time understanding the scriptures, and you'll have a hard time living in opposition to the world today in its efforts to get you to deny what is a primary symbol of our relationship to God, the family. The, because our relationship to God is, is not merely as individual to individual, but it is a relationship of union, praise God. You, you don't just have a, a deal with Jesus Christ. You don't just make a bargain with Jesus Christ. You are united in him. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So let's, uh, let's get, get our, our head back on with respect to where we are in stall. Remember? The basic problem that Stahl is, is pointing to us is what is private law all about? What are we, what are we doing in, in private law? So today we, we tend to think of private law as a technology. A technology is a, a, a knowledge of a means for getting things done. And private law, we use contract, we use property to, to seek certain values, to promote GDP. Uh, we, we want to, to promote certain kinds of uh, human flourishing. It's just a means uh, to get there. But, but that's not how Stahl understands it at, at all. He says, no, uh, private law is about life. Private law is the area in which uh, private persons realize their, their life. And life, uh, the, the primary barrier to our life is we have material needs. We are both spirit and, and clay, uh, and we, we try to strive after those material needs. That's true. That, that part of the world's approach today, focusing on, on technical aspects of the law, that has value. But, but Stahl says you can never explain the, the dignity that private law wants to impart by law. You can never understand its real structure just looking at those kind of goals. Uh, you have to understand it in terms of an idea of human personality. And remember what he says is, what private law says is, get your food, get your land, get the means of, of your vocation, um, make your, your deals with, with other people, do all those things, but you, you must do it not just to satisfy your, your body. This is the image of the chickens, right? If private law were set up so that we were just fed like chickens, we might be fatter, or we might be leaner, we might be healthier, we might all be richer, but we would not be human. Because what it means to be human is, is to take what you need in keeping with your inward spiritual nature, which is to be made in the image of God. So this is where we, we gain ideas. We must be free as, as God is free. We must have responsibility as God has responsibility. We must have constancy of will, as God has constancy of will. And as we see today, we have to have relationship. We have, we have to have the ability to unite, to, to be one across many, and many in one, because that's what we find in God's personality. So Stahl says man is lifted out of his material base. We're not ruled like animals. We're not shepherded like sheep, we're, we're not just pointed to the water and forced to drink and pointed to the food and, and forced to eat because we are material. We need to eat and drink, but we're not just material. We have a, a spirit. We have, we, we have a divine breath. We have something more than material. We are made in the image of God, and that must be reflected. In the manner of achieving satisfaction of the things that we need in, in life, and today we're going to be talking about the need for uh, satisfaction, uh, we, have, we have desires for one another, sexual desires for one another. We have desires to uh, procreate. We have desires to see our, our families go on. We have these real desires. We as a, a human race desire the human race to go on. You, we want to achieve all of those things. It's basic. You'd think the world would think this was more important because they have this evolutionary theory that says it's all just about passing on the genes. But these very same evolutionary people who, who claim that they are hard-minded, hard-thinking, practical people, look at a world where the countries which are most advanced have created a family law system where nobody wants to have children. 
they, they, these uh, evolutionary uh, minds who claim everything is just about the, the survival of the fittest have created systems where people don't want to have children. If you had a farm and none of the animals would, would breed, none of the animals would have children, that would be a good clue that something was wrong. But, but we in our advanced societies have created societies where people do not want to have children. Where having children is a problem. Where we, we douse our bodies with, with chemicals. And we're, we're learning now that all these contraceptive chemicals create huge rates of, of depression that they create all sorts of unknown health consequences. We don't care. Our, our rage a, against a, a forwarding our, ourselves is so great that we, we slaughter the unborn, we douse ourselves with, with chemicals to the point where our numbers are declining in ways that if it were animals doing this, everybody would say unhealthy. And Stahl would say, of course it's unhealthy. Of course no one wants to have children because you have created legal systems that tell people you are just individuals. You have, you have told people that we're going to create legal systems where you are just to gain your material desire for sex through pornography, through one night stands, through promiscuity. We're going to dignify those as constitutional rights. But you have created legal systems that in no way reflect the need to realize your physical desires, which really need to be satisfied, in terms of the image of God in which you're made. This is Stahl's point about private law, right? We, we need to satisfy our, our material needs. And, and sex, family, procreation, those are great basic material needs. But you have to do it in relationship to the image of God in which you're made. And nobody in their heart of hearts really believes that the societies of pornography, promiscuity, abortion, chemical self-castration that we have created today reflect a, a raising of man above his animal desires for sexuality into something which is noble and principled, virtuous and good. This is the basis for private law in the broadest sense. The right of private law provides the material for the manifestation of the personality of man. His innermost being reveals itself in the manner and measure by which he relates to his needs for sustenance in the world. So if you understood what that meant with respect to property, now we're going to shift that with, to, to sexuality. Uh, we have an aspect of our human personality by which men and women desire to come together, we, by which parents and children come together. We're, we, are, we are all uniquely tied to family. Uh, not everybody is a property owner. Not everyone is born owning property. Not everybody is born in contractual relations. Not everyone forms those relations. It's very probable you will. But everyone begins life as somebody's child. Every, everybody has their identity in other people's sexual expression and in, in their unity with the results and consequences of that sexual expression. It's very easy to see how this is the most necessary, the most fundamental expression of human personality. What the law is, is telling you in family law is, is about what it means to be born into the world as the result of other people's sexual expression. What does their sexual expression mean? Is, is sexual expression something that should only be done in bonds of, of faithfulness between the two people having sexual relations? Is, is it something that ties them inexorably to the fruit of that sexual relation, to their, to their children? Or are we just a bunch of individuals who, who are tied together only insofar as individuals can be by, by shared contractual and property relations. That's the doctrine of today. It is a sick view of human personality which denies the potentiality, the, the necessity, the, the, the real essential value 
uh, of recognizing that every child, ideally, should, should be born into a real and permanent unity of fidelity, and their relationship of their parent, with their parents should be real and deep as well. Not because we want to impose barriers on people, but because you in your human essence are so dignified that, that like God, you, you not only uh, possess the ability to deal with people at arm's length, to, to pass goods back and forth, but, but you can become one with someone. That you can have such deep relations with, with people that in your union with a man or a woman, you can create another inestimably valuable relationship through the fruit of that love with other people. And again and again and again, that's how God describes his relationship with us. This is a, a fundamental image of, of what it means to be with God, for him to be our, our father and for us to be his children, for Christ to be our, our bridegroom and the church to be the bride. Marriage, husband-wife relations, children, parent-child relations are fundamental to the way that God's personality is revealed to us. It's fundamental to what it means to be made in God's image. And we deny it today because we don't say that man and woman are really united. We don't say that they're really one. We say, ah, they have a legal relationship which is lesser than a simple commercial relationship. It's, it's a lie and it's, it's destroying us today. So last week we talked about this in terms of contract. Last week meaning, you know, the former week, the last time we had, we had class. And so we got an idea of, of something related to this. So a contract uh, takes what is a, a material will. We, we, we want to be able to bind ourselves, but then tomorrow we change our mind and we want to do something else. But God's personality, the, the image in which we're made, is one of constancy of will. Know that the Lord is your God. He's a faithful God. He keeps his covenant. We, in, in contract law, are, are drawn to say, yes, you can, you can make declarations of your will. You can bring yourself through your will and bind yourself to other people. But there are structures of faithfulness that you have to utilize uh, in that. That's why, why contract law, Professor Purnell was just telling me, how beautiful contract law is. I agree with him. It's very beautiful. It's, it's beautiful because it's a way of imaging God. It's, it's beautiful because it, it, it takes our very mutable wills and it reminds everyone that, that constancy of will is a potential that you have. Constancy of will is what you need for the full expression of your, of your human personality. And it runs contrary to our, our modern ideas of freedom. If, if we just care about freedom, get rid of contract. Let people say one thing today and another thing tomorrow. But, but no, what private law does is it's, it's a means by which free beings can express their will in constancy, in faithfulness over time. If you understand why, why contract law is an expression of a dimension of human personality that wouldn't be expressed if we just let people be totally free, if we didn't create these these bonds of, of contract law, then you can begin to understand something about, about marriage. Here's how Stahl, this was in your reading from before, how he differentiates contract from, from marriage. A contractual bond is essentially different from the bond of love, marriage. Its commitment does not arise through, making, through one's making the well-being of another a goal of his own but simply through the immutability of one's will. When I make a contract, I'm committing myself to a form of faithfulness with respect to that promise. But the, but the relationship is within me. It's between me and my own promise. That's what's being, being mandated there. That's what's, what's be, it's the immutability of my own will that's centrally at issue. But the immutability of my will is, is not the deepest and grandest dimension of either God's love for us 
or of, of our human personality made in, in God's image. There's another dimension to it. Marriage, by contrast with, with contract, is a giving up of separate purposes and interests. We don't do this in contract. That's why you can have a lawsuit between the two people. It is not a giving up of separate purposes and interests. Rather, it is the two persons themselves becoming one. Contract preserves the separation of interests. A, a, a mutual binding of wills is, is made, but the interests remain separate. And so every contract is not simply serve the other person. Every contract is not simply wait and see what's best for that person and, and serve them in that. That's marriage. In marriage, there is a uniting of persons. And, and if you think of this in terms of the potential of, of human legal personality, you would think like this. Oh, with contract I learned that I'm not like an animal. I don't live in the instant, but rather I can, like God, bind myself to faithfulness through time. I, uh, there is something of eternity on my heart. And even though I experience time from instant to instant to instant, I'm capable of God-like faithfulness across time. Well, marriage has something to do with that. But there's a, a, a big difference. Marriage may be begun by a contract where I say, I, I agree, I contract to marry with you. But the act of marriage itself is no contract. It is the accomplishment of a union. And that's why in, in the old days, in, in law, to, to make marriage, it wasn't enough to say the vows. You also had to consummate the marriage. The, the marriage had to be consummated with physical union. It was at that point that the marriage itself truly began, not with the vows, which is initiated, sets up the meaning for the physical consummation. But the actual union of the persons, that's marriage. That's gone today. It's gone. What Stahl is, is describing here, what, what everybody, what, what all everybody, this is why legal history is good, how everybody understood marriage, which is not simply a, a relationship of two individuals, but a uniting of two individuals. Marriage is, is, is not a contract. Marriage is a union. That's gone. It's a disaster. We're, we're dying because of it, because what we've told people is you, you lack as part of your human personality a potential not just to, to make contracts and agreements, but a, po a, a, a possibility for real union with other people. And then we don't even enforce the contractual uh, rights with respect to marriage as much as we would a business contract. So there's a double uh, ruin going on. In addition to the constancy of will in God's personality, we have been shown something else about God. God's will is relational. It's not only that God is capable and does exhibit faithfulness in his dealings with us, but he wills himself into union with us. It's not only that, that God in his, in his nature is capable of, of faithfulness between his own plans and his own will, but God is himself the unity of three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit united in love. This relational, unifying aspect of divine personality has not revealed itself in property. It hasn't revealed itself in contract or, or torts, but it reveals itself in family law. So think about what, I, what I'm saying now. One of the strangest passages, if you don't know about the, the Trinity, if you don't know about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Genesis 1.26. Unique passage in the, the scriptures where God speaks of himself in the plural in, in what he's doing. And it creates this, this great parallel. God said, let us make man in our image. Whose image? Our image. There, there is in God a relationship. 
God is himself relational in his personality. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule. God has relations in him, and he makes us for relation. You, you are not made, contrary to what all the law, all the, the, the culture tells you today, you are not simply one. You are one. God is one. But you are one in relation. If, if you think of yourself simply as one, you make a mistake. You are one, but you are also a member of many. Okay, all of you check for a belly button. Do all of you have belly buttons? All of you are, are part of, of, of a great commonality. You did not spring from the ground like, like a mushroom. You, you, did, you did not pop into being. You are not whole and complete on yourself. Life was given to you. You are, you are part of a, a greater whole. You can think of yourself as one. Jesus can, can think of himself as, as one. But you must also think of yourself as a member. This isn't the destruction. This is one of the most basic aspects of, of how we understand God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are really distinct. But they are also really one. You are really distinct from others. But you are in real relationship with them. God made us for relationship. And, and so right away, he says, God created them in the image. Male and female, he created them. Male and, and female, in, in case you, you, you don't know this, if you're not married, and you have unbelievably chaste thoughts, male and female are drawn to each other. Human beings, man is made male and female. One thing, man, this is how it's put in the scriptures, man, human being, is made male and female. Man cannot express, humanity cannot express what it is meant for, which is to multiply and fill the earth without relation between its parts. Its members must come into relation with one another, not only in the, the sense of having children, but also in the, in the psychological sense of Adam had no help meet, and he, it wasn't good. Everything else was good. But, but Adam lacked uh, something that would complete him. We, we cannot be humanity without being male and female. You cannot be female without understanding yourself in relation to, to male. You cannot be male without understanding yourself in relationship to female. We are, we are made for relationship. And we are also made not just for male-female relation, but we can imitate God again. We imitate God in male-female relations, in, in being what we are in relationship to, to others. But we also uh, relate God... God made us in his image, in his likeness. And when we have children, we're told we do the same thing. Genesis 5.1. This is the big retelling of the whole creation story really, really, really quickly. God created man. And he made man in the likeness of God. Adam, this is the, the immediate parallel. The next line is he made the male and female. Adam became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his own image. So see the parallel that's being drawn here. God creates man in his image. Adam and Eve, I think Eve was also involved in this process. She gets lesser billing here. Adam became the father of a son. Now there's a difference. God creates, right? Man propagates. There's a big difference there. One brings something out of nothing. The other brings something out of something. Big difference. But there's a strong parallel. The, the son of Adam bears his image and likeness just as man bears God's image and likeness. What we are doing as male and female is like what Christ is doing with the church. It's what we are as a, a united couple more than what we are a, alone is like God in his plural relationships. What we do when we have children is like what God does in creating man. There is a, a, a parallel 
between man and God drawn in these, these scriptures, which we're told this is what it means to be us. And today we deny this. We, we deny that man and woman can really be united. We say their individuality requires that they be able to, to split up at any time. Their individuality requires. The United States Supreme Court says, it is fundamental to your individuality, it is fundamental to your human rights that you be able to cheat on your wife. I stand before you, empowered by the United States Supreme Court, told that fundamental justice requires that it be lawful for me to be able to betray my family through adultery. Shame on them, tyrants, shame on them. This is a, a fundamental lie that is propagated over and over and over again, that sexual individual freedom is more important to my human personality than my ability to unite with my wife. Shame on them. What a lie. And how many people are led astray by that lie? This is what it means to be human to be made in God's image. This is what it means to be human, to fundamentally be in relation, to be made for relation with God and other people. This is what it means to be human, to reenact what God has done with us, with our own children. This is who we are. But every aspect of our modern family law tells us that our individuality is what we are that we, we don't lack this ability for real union, that it's too scary, it's too dangerous, it's too problematic. That's the great lie of our age. Here, here Jesus Christ describing in the, in the, the, the last uh, great prayer he makes before his, his crucifixion, uh, what, what his relationship with the Father is like and what the capacity of of uh, human personality is. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That's all says is also the basic description of marriage, that, that man can be one with his wife and his wife can be one with him, she and him and he and her, not two separate people, but, but two people who are interrelated with one another so that their identities are not extinguished, but one is in the other and the other is in the other. The other is in the other. Yeah, I guess that works. I'll put it in Jesus' words because they're better. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now, Jesus here, of course, is talking about the effects of the great wedding, the great marriage by which Jesus and the church are, are united, and so mankind is united to God. Jesus is talking about the great adoption, by which through our unity with Jesus Christ, by becoming brothers with Him, we become children of God. He, he's talking about those, those great things. But, but understand what this means. Man is to be raised to his potentiality, to be raised in understanding from the human institutions of marriage, from the human institutions of parent-child relations, these are the natural signs and insignia that God has decreed for all human societies to follow so that we might have a ladder pointing us to heaven. And this is why Paul says over and over again, marriage is a mystery. The way a man loves a woman, the way a woman loves a man, it's a mystery. It's a revelation of Christ in the church. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Every marriage law throughout the whole history of the world has always been a testimony to this kind of possibility. By, by saying to, to two ordinary men and women, 
you in your sexual attraction to each other, you in your possibility for, for union, understand what you are. You're not just two atoms separated from each other. You as a human being have a real possibility for union with your spouse. And we are going to treat you not as animals that rut and mate and then disperse in the woods. We are going to treat you as human beings who have the real capability for union. That's the universal testimony of mankind until we discovered our human rights, until we discovered our noble individuality, until we became nations of pornographers and adulterers, until we, we trumpeted and said, adultery is my right and fornication is my essence. I have the right to rut like an animal and to betray like a swine. That's who we are today, but that is a lie. You are not that. You have the potential for union. And if the government lied to you and said, hey, you can't control your will. You know, it's too hard to control your will. We've got to get rid of contract law. Because people can't decide today what they're going to do tomorrow. People change their minds. People don't know enough about, about the future. If, if, if people said that, we would all rebel. We'd say, no, I, of course I might change my mind. But I, but I have to be able to deal with people as a human being, as somebody who can, can make a determination for myself. Or we would riot if they took away contract law from us. But marriage law has been gone longer than a century in the West. And people are learning the lesson very well. They're like people who act, who have forgotten all about contract law, who have been taught to believe that you can't make contracts because it's just too hard to keep your will. So in the United States today, 45% of marriages end in, in divorce. That's, that's down from the 90s when it was up over, over 50%. But more and more people every year don't get married. So that today in the United States, 60% of children grow up without their mother or their father. Uh, in many communities, in the, in the cities in the United States, as much as 90% of children are born outside of marriages. We're learning these lessons very well. We, we are being taught by the state that we do not have what God has given us. The ability for a man to be one with a woman and a woman to be one with a man and for them to be connected to the fruit of their, of their uh, relationship, their, their children, inexorably and permanently. My, my children as, as Americans are in the minority because they're being raised by their mother and father. They're, they're increasingly weird because they're raised by their, their mother and their, their father. That's not what God made us for. This is what God made us for. Adam looked at Eve, and he, he saw one with whom he had the potential for union. Not, not merely him, but he saw that, that God had created a way for, for us to experience as, as a, a human race over and over and over again this potential. This is now bone of my bone. Think about what that means. This isn't another person. God, what have you given me? You haven't given me a tree or a rock or, or a, a cow that's something different from me. This is my own body. Bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she's, she's taken out of me. And so that when we're brought back together, it's not two strangers that have been brought back together, but it, it's two that were meant to be together who, who become whole in their union. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And they will become one flesh. Denied today. The government denies it. The government claims the, the sovereign right to separate your flesh. I, I live as a married man under the, the storm cloud. And the state at any time threatens to separate me from my own flesh. If, if I lived in a state where the state said, well, if somebody who claims your arm can come and, and have your arm removed, that would be tyranny. 
That would be injustice. If they say, well, we can come and we can take your organs if we really, really want to, that would be tyranny. But, but my government and your government claims the right to separate you from your spouse, to separate you from your own flesh. Jesus said what, what God has, has, has joined, let no man separate. But, but the state today recognizes no God, and it recognizes no union of man and woman. And so it delights. It's proud. It celebrates as justice. In the name of equality, in the name of individual rights, every man must be able to commit adultery. And anyone who wants to must be able to separate from their husband or wife. And this is our justice. This is a, a, only a reduction of, of man to a, a small atom who, unlike God, is, is incapable of forming life in relationship, who is incapable of being one and many at the same time. We, we have needs. We have needs to, for sex. We have, have desires for having children. Stahl doesn't deny that. There's nothing puritanical about Stahl. Christians, Christians aren't afraid of talking about the need and desire for sex, sexual passion, all of these kinds of things. Read the Song of Songs. It's all over there. Big deal. But we, we also say all of these things must be realized in a way that is consistent and harmonious with our human personality. And if you understand that you are capable of uniting with another person in sexual relationship, not only for a fleeting second, like two animals in the streets, having a, a brief time together and then separating, but you are, you are capable of becoming one with a woman, one with a man, that you are capable of imitating God, not just in having children, but of, of raising them in the admonition of the Lord so that they come to share with you not only physical flesh, but also to share with your, your soul and your mind. You would never desire those other things. And if you did, just like a man who doesn't want to make contracts because he might change his mind tomorrow, we should not have a legal system that allows people to act like animals in that regard, just as we don't with property, just as we don't with contract, just as we don't in other things. Because that is not an elevation of man's freedom. Is it a degradation and destruction of man's potential? Why does God ignore our prayers? The prophet asked. It is because the Lord is acting as the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Because you have broken faith with her, though she is your partner. The wife of your marriage covenant. All those things are true. What's the apex of it? It's not just a partnership. It's not just a, a covenant. It is a union. Has not the Lord made them one? The covenant is the occasion for this. God doesn't just go around picking random people and making them one. But when they covenant together, he makes them one. In flesh and spirit, they are his as they're united. And why one? Why does God make us one? Well, the Supreme Court of the United States in Obergefell said so it's for our sexual pleasure. It's for our human intimacy. And so you can marry anything you want. A man can marry a man. A woman can marry a woman. Anybody can marry anybody whom they can feel material sexual delight with. No. Because he was seeking godly offspring. Not just offspring, mind you. Offspring that comes from, from the, the union of people who understand and can pass on to others that man is capable of more than being in himself but he can really be in another person, just as Jesus prayed. That he can, just as God made us in his image, 
raise children in his own. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. What's at stake in driving family law out of, out of the private law, of, of seeing that it is a fundamental aspect, it is a fundamental way that we signal and uphold our, our potentiality, not just to be in ourselves, but to be, to be one with, with other people. It's our spiritual destiny. Take this away from people and you fundamentally alter their relationship with God. That's what God's saying here. Why does God not answer your prayers? Because you've forgotten God. How have we forgotten God? Because you do not honor marriage. What does that have to do with remembering God? What does marriage, my relationship with a woman, have to do with honoring God? Because it's, it's fundamental to who God is, that God is a God of relationship. He is a God who, who takes many and makes one out of them. In himself, he is many in one. In his relationship with us, he's desiring unity with us. He, he sent his son to marry us. He sent his son to adopt us as his children. He made us as his children. He gave us his image. We have a natural relationship with God because we're made in his image. We need him to fulfill us. Why does God not answer our prayers today? Why is there such, such misery? There's such wealth. Why are our suicide rates going up? There's such wealth. Why are, are people extinguishing themselves with, with drugs? Why are, are, are people turning in despair and, and becoming uh, enslaved to drug addiction? We have such wealth. Why aren't people having children? Why, in times of wealth, when it's so much easier to share? Why are people so much greedier? Why aren't people willing to share with their own children? We have so much more than past generations, but we're not willing to put it into action and share with our own children. Why? Because God doesn't answer our prayers when we deny who He is. It's gone today, okay? Understand it's gone. Understand that there's been a revolution in the law. The, the law of every country used to firmly recognize the unity of man and woman. There was a separate property rights for men and women. Men and women in marriage who were married, they had, they had one property right. They couldn't make contracts with each other because they're not two people. They couldn't sue each other for torts because they had one interest. They couldn't commit certain kinds of criminal violations. They couldn't conspire together. You couldn't be an accomplice for your husband or wife because you're one person. You couldn't testify against your husband and wife because you have one interest. And since I know you all love private international law. Now, come on, guys. In private international law, every husband and wife, they had one domicile. Only one law could apply to them per, per, per dispute. They could only have one nationality, one status, one religion, because they were one person. This is the law everywhere. Now they're just two separate people with the kinds of relations that contract could create between them. We, we've destroyed it. Every legal system in the world used to say very simply, if you want to have sex, get married. If you have sex outside of marriage, it's illegal. It's either the, it's the crime of fornication or adultery. If you're having, having sexual relations with somebody and you're not married to them, that's fornication. And if you're having sexual relations with a marriage, married person, that's adultery, crimes. But, but now we've said marriage isn't about sexual relation. There, there's no tie between my desire for sexual fulfillment, and fulfilling that in terms of my potentiality for relation with another person. And even when people do get married, we impose the most bizarre kinds of limitation on what they swear to. I am incapable legally of making a lifetime vow to my wife. 
I, I cannot bind myself permanently to my wife under U.S. law or under Korean law. If I could under Korean law, I'd get married in Korea. I, 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 there is no legal institution that teaches people about the, their capability, not just for making an agreement with another person about, about sex, but for creating an actual union between them. There is no legal institution that if I, if I could form such a marriage that would give me permanent rights over my children. Something like, something akin to the, the kind of permanency that we see with respect to contract or, or property and its permanency. No. If my wife decides tomorrow, and I just monstrous, let's say somebody else's wife, somebody else with six kids, who's, uh, their wife decides tomorrow that they, they would like to, to seek a divorce for no reason, the court will just say, well, uh, you, uh, this other guy with six children, uh, will decide whether or not you get custody of your children based on our determination of what's in the best interest of the children. And if I were to go to the court and say, did I do something wrong? Was I, was I abusive? Was I not providing? Did I do something wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. You were great. It's just we've decided to give custody of your children to your wife because we think it's in your best interest. And if I were to say to them, but the we here is my wife and my children. Who are you? I didn't marry you. Who are you, judge? Who, who are you to come between the union of a man and a woman and their children? Who are you to decide? Did God give you the, the, the duty and the right to raise these children? God says he wants unity so that there will be a godly raising of children. How can you give my children to one who has abandoned our marriage without any claim of fault? How can I, I teach my children what is, is godly? If, if you teach them that the, the, the one who, who, who should raise them is the one that abandoned the marriage. But courts do that all the time. But most fundamentally, most easy, I should say, to, to see, families have no legal personality today. Families once were treated as a unit in law. Husband, wife, children were a unit in law. They had legal personality. We still have these. We call these corporations. You know who we give it to? We don't give it to two people who come together and swear an oath and a bond of fundamental union and love. We give it to, to uh, business people who would like to form an aggregation of capital and they don't want to have personal relations. They don't have to form a personal relation. They want to be able to aggregate capital anonymously. To those people, we give real legal personality. Those unions cannot be divided because that's where our heart is. Money. What, what we love is the union of capital. The union of business interests, well, we love permanent business judgment rule. You've got to protect it. The court will not investigate, even investigate real allegations of fault. No fault divorce in corporate law. Forget about it. We won't even have fault-based divorce in corporate law. Why? Because that's something we care about and love. But sexual purity, imaging God, the union of man and woman, the raising of children, we don't care about those things at all. We don't care about the image of God. We don't, we don't care about our, our greatest and most amazing aspect of human personality, the place where our, our divinity comes most into view. That, that not only can I, I be an individual in this world, but I can be one with another person. Not, not only like God, can, can I come into a union with, with many persons in which each of us have our individual personality, but yet we're still one. We're, we're drawn into that just like God to, to spread our image abroad. What an image of God it is. But do we care about that? Do you care about that? I, I tell you, if you care about that, then you look at this world and you say, we need a revolution. Just like the, the feminist revolution, the capitalist revolutions that destroyed marriage 
in favor of, of facile and simplistic, animalistic views of human being. They wanted a revolution and they worked for it. You should want a revolution. I don't know when that revolution is going to come. But I do know this. You live in a world which is, is telling you you are less than you are. It's telling you, uh, just as if it said you can't really form contracts, it's telling you you can't really form marriage. And it will always hold the sword over you and it will always say, we reserve the right to disregard your marriage at any time. So you've got to figure out ways to protect your marriage, to protect your family. You, you've got to burn with a, a stronger inner desire to really form true, godly, honoring marriages today. If you, if you go with the flow, if you listen to the culture, you will be destroyed in this regard. There's been a revolution. This aspect of, of human personality, which is fundamental to who God is, it's fundamental to the image in, in which he, he made us, it has been completely effaced from the law. The law is opposed to it. The law refuses to honor it. The, the law dishonors it. The law divides flesh. Now, so the, the, the double burden is on you. To reverse this, this monstrous tyranny, this monstrous revolution, and until that happens, to, to protect that in your life in every way that you can. To, to protect and help others to, to protect their marriages as well. Is this a great burden? It is. But on the other hand, this is the image in which you're made. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you that you call us children, that through Jesus Christ we, we know of our adoption as, as your children. We know about the, the, the family of, of God. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came as a, a bridegroom to the bride, his church, so that we might be adopted as, as your children. Oh, Father, the, the world today is so opposed to this desire for real relation and union with others that you've put in, in our hearts. It tries to stamp out and efface the institutions of a family that you created and marriage that you created. But help us, Lord, to, to persevere as, as we learn about who you are and who we are through Jesus Christ, as we learn about your fatherhood. Help us truly to marry and truly to found families in this very difficult time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.